Hi everybody, welcome back. My name is Lori. Today I am excited to share with you stories about how I got started with my fountain pen journey. And I am hopping on the hashtag eight pen question that was started last year this time by Simone and Leanne Likes. I did actually sign up to be a part of this and I was slotted with April 6th and I completely forgot about it. So my apologies if I messed up the train in any way. The entire month of March was filled with stories of people's pen journey, which I really enjoyed. And I love that Simona and Leanne are so inclusive with this. It's been really fun to get to know different creators and hear their story. So I have the questions here in front of me. So let's just dig right in. Question number one, when and how did your fountain pen journey begin? As I've watched a few of the videos, I've discovered that a lot of people got started with fountain pens in a similar way that I did. After I watched a video from one of my favorite creators, Helen, over at Coffee Monsters Co., she shared with us a Pelican M800 that she purchased for herself for her college graduation. And I was intrigued by this video and I, I just loved the whole process and how she explained it. Prior to fountain pens, I was really doing my best to get into brush lettering. I had spent hundreds of dollars on Tombow pens. I also bought an entire kit of the Faber-Castell brush pens. I was taking classes online about how to do brush lettering and I was really struggling with it. While I always considered myself to have pretty decent handwriting, I really couldn't get the hang of the brush lettering. Also around the same time, I was on my steady decline in adding to my bullet journals. I was kind of a bullet journal wannabe and I just never really got the hang of it. I took to fountain pens, however, like a moth to a flame. I just dove head first. So the very first fountain pen that I ordered was a Pilot Kakuno based on the recommendations of a lot of people on YouTube. I also ordered a Pilot Metropolitan. One of my very favorite first pens was the Macchiato in the Caveco Sport. I actually gave my first macchiato to my daughter and then I missed it so much that I replaced it within the past six months. I love baby Kavecos, I have a bunch of them. I would say that my first investment pen at the time was a Twisby Eco in white with rose gold trim. I distinctly remember really agonizing over paying $50 for a pen. So I bought my Twisby and that was the beginning of this crazy, crazy fountain pen adventure that I've been on ever since. And I got into this around August or September of 2022. Number two asks about what my, what my favorite inks were in the beginning and what my go-to inks are now. I would say that in large part in the beginning, um, the first two bottles I actually brought down here to share with you um, because I put so much thought into these bottles and this I think is a great illustration of the inks that I went for when I first got started. So when I got that Twisby Eco in the mail, I didn't have a bottle of ink and I'm extremely impulsive at times and I wanted to use it the day it came in. So I drove to Cambridge to this place called Bob Slates, which is located in Harvard Square. They carried fountain pen ink. I knew I wanted but brown ink and I knew I didn't want to spend a lot of money. I ended up with this Pelican Brilliant Brown which to this day is a go-to pen of mine. I just recently put this in my Goulet exclusive Earl Grey Bennu Euphoria and it is so beautiful in there. I was definitely taken aback by the cost of like the Graphon Faber-Castell ink bottles. Some of the other ones that at this particular store were upwards of $30. I think I paid like $16 or $18 for this. So in the beginning, I really just went for basics. I never thought that I would be interested in oranges and greens and and blues. I just thought I was going to stick to the basics, have a couple of fountain pens, and call it a day. The first gold nib pen that I purchased was on Amazon. A lot of people purchased their first gold nib pen on Amazon. A lot of people purchased this in particular because it was under $90 and it was the Sailor Shikiori Autumn Moon pen. I think at the time I paid like $87. Now I think it's even under $80. But I bought that pen and then I bought this Ferris Wheel Press Stroke of Midnight ink and I was so excited to see how these work together. And then I was miserably disappointed when the shimmer in this ink did not work very well in that pen. To this day, that pen is very temperamental. The best ink that I have found to work in there is Three Kings, which is a diamond, diamond ink vent calendar ink. I think in the beginning, I did not have any appreciation for the way the pen and the ink and the paper worked together or didn't work together. So I was very discouraged by the ink. I was very discouraged mostly by the pen. That was quite an investment for me at the time. I have 
since grown to love the ink and pen just separately. Now I would say that my ink choices have just broadened so much. I have leaned into some of the more lighter neutral colors. I feel like I'm not as excited about super saturated inks anymore. I like to see some shading or sheening in an ink. I really do appreciate shimmer. There's definitely a part of me that loves just a little glitz and glam. However, I've been very frustrated with a lot of the shimmer inks and how they behave in certain pens. Recently, I've kind of dialed back on shimmer inks. I really enjoy how they look as an ink sample, but as a practical matter in my pens, they don't always work for me. I think I have enough shimmer inks that will last me for a long time. One of my favorite shimmer inks right now is Masquerade, which was in this past year's Diamine Ink Vent calendar. I have that in my Scribo Madalena and it's beautiful and I love to see the shimmer in that ink. So that is a great combination. However, not all shimmer inks do well with all of my pens. So I've just learned to appreciate the nuances of inks and how they work and how they behave in their properties. Currently, Sailor number 273, I've really loved. I put that in my new Peniter um, pen. I've also enjoyed that ink in my Pelican M800. It's also great in my Twisby Cream. That ink is wonderful and it has like a little bit of like sheening around the edges and I just love that ink and that's on the lighter side. So if I can find a lighter neutral tone ink that's also very legible, that's what I love. I've also been loving the brown pinks, Terranishi Rose I like. It's a little more orange than my favorite which is Aphrodite by Le bon, which I can't seem to get anywhere. Robert Oster Cafe Crema. I'm really into the browns, into the neutrals. I started with my Pelican brown ink. I'm still on the brown train. I've definitely experienced expanded to a wider palette of inks and I just think that it just adds to the richness of this hobby when you can transform the experience you have with a pen just based on what ink you have in there and what paper you're using. So it's it's just endless possibilities which is what I find really fun about this hobby. Number three is how have your pen and ink taste changed over time? I think I just touched on that a little bit. I think I approached it more from a practical standpoint before. I would consider myself a collector for sure, but I also believe in using everything. There isn't a single pen in my collection that has not been inked up. In fact, I'm, as I mentioned, pretty impulsive. Usually when things come in the mail, I ink it up immediately, at least do a dip test. I don't believe in just like putting them in a drawer. I would say that I'm guilty of having, you know, like little sub collections within my fountain pen collection. Like I have been enjoying my Mont Blancs. I have a little growing number of Esterbrook Estes that I really love. My sailors recently have been just so much fun for me. If you had asked me about a year ago, I thought I was completely done with sailors, but I feel like I'm enjoying them more and more. Really depends on my mood. I love my Italian pens. So I think that I just keep wanting more. I definitely live in the gray area, which can get me into trouble sometimes. I'm not very good at creating like boundaries for myself. So if I like something, I just kind of go in head first and that's definitely what I have done with fountain pens. I think eventually I need to slow my roll a little bit. I guess the biggest change for me is that I have been recently appreciating finer nibs. Um, I feel like they have their place for me. I, I love to put a ton of ink down on a piece of paper and a juicy broad nib, of course, but sometimes I can really appreciate a finer nib. I think when you have a pen that writes really beautiful and it's a fine or an extra fine nib, I think it speaks to the quality of that pen even more than if you have a broad nib that writes. I think it's more difficult to find a fine or an extra fine nib that writes beautifully than it is to find a medium or a broad nib that writes well. I think I've just grown to appreciate all the nuances of fountain pens. It's something new every day, like I said, depending on what ink you have, so that's been really fun. Are there inks and pens that you have yet to try but you would like to? Aren't there always? There are certain inks that I haven't tried, like Diamine Ancient Copper is something that gets brought up all the time. I'm like, why have I not tried that ink yet? When I watch other people's videos, I always see beautiful inks that I'm like, oh, I have to make a mental note of that. But there's not one in particular that I'm like dying to try. I did really want to try Taranishi Rose. That was one that I recently picked up and that has been fantastic. I feel like I need to use what I have when it comes to inks and pens for the most part. My friend Lau from Kenshin Crafts has the Aurora Volterra 
and it's just so beautiful and I would love to try one. They are definitely pricey, but I love my Leonardo's, I love my Scribos, I love my Visconti's. I'm sure that the Aurora will have a place in my collection because I love my Italian pens and the Volterra is just so beautiful. It reminds me a little bit of Angel Skin from Leonardo. However, it's more the neutrals where the Angel Skin is a little on the lighter side. That is a pen that is on my list as well. For a long time, I only saw that with a gold nib and it was around $500 and I just never made a place for it in my collection. It's coming soon now with a steel nib and I personally love Leonardo steel nibs. So I would love to get that angel skin because it's under a $200 pen. I know that I love my Leonardo's. I have a little Leonardo collection. But the next Leonardo that I get, if it is the angel skin, I would love for it to be a custom grime, probably a cursive smooth italic. Also something that I've learned about my pen taste is that I appreciate an ink window more and more and that I don't think that pistons are the end all be all as far as a filling mechanism. I love a piston fill, like my Pelican is the smoothest, most beautiful piston fill, but if it doesn't have an ink win window, it can be a little frustrating. It takes a little bit longer to clean out. I don't think that a piston fill automatically adds value. I, I know that the engineering of it is more difficult than a cartridge converter, but I think that sometimes a piston fill for me is not worth the extra money. If it's really just more about the material that I like or a particular nib, instead of spending the extra money on a piston, sometimes I would rather spend a little bit less just to get like a particular resin that I'm crazy about. Another pen that I can see in my future somewhere, I, I would never spend what it cost, but I would love a Tachia pen. One that I really like is the Winter Breath. I just think that's so pretty with the little eggshell on it. There's such beauty in certain pens. I am just at that point where I don't know if I'm willing to really go to that next level for the artistry that you're paying for over what you get like from a functional standpoint. Um, I do have an affiliate code at Atlas and I've been saving some of my credits over there and I think maybe I would pull the trigger and use my credits over there if I save them long enough to get a pen that I wouldn't pay cash for. Thank you to anyone who's ever used my link over at Atlas. It's been fun to kind of bank stuff and create a little wish list of what I think I could get with my credit. I do think I would like to save for a special pen over there. I just don't know what pen it is. So that's actually a good thing because I just keep banking my credit and there'll be something that catches my eye one day. Number five is what is your grail pen? Um, I don't I don't really have a particular pen. I mean, I just mentioned the Tachia, that is gorgeous, uh, but I don't have a, a grail pen, so to speak, right now. Uh, I purchased a 149, a vintage 149 from Mont Blanc that for a while was my grail pen. I was really waiting to get my first Pelican and I ended up purchasing that on eBay actually. I got it in the brown black, which I absolutely love. I just inked that up yesterday, so I used it for my morning pages today, so I'm feeling especially affectionate about that Pelican. I would like to maybe get another Pelican. The Pelican that I have has a fine nib and it writes like a broad, so I think I'd like to get an extra fine nib on another M800. I'm curious about like a King of Pen or an M1000, but those are very large pens. And I already have my Mont Blanc 149, so I don't know how many like extra large pens I'd like to use. The M800 is just such a perfect size for me. I think a grill pen creation for me would be the M800 Pelican in one of the white bodied pens. I would be all done if they ever made a Pelican M800 with that design with gold trim or with like a blush pink body, I would be out of my mind excited. <laughs> I haven't seen that yet. I would love for Pelican to make their M800s with the white body, but I'm patiently waiting. Number six is how many pens do I currently own? I am not really good about keeping track of my pens. <laughs> uh, I think I have about 75 or 80, but I would say a good 30 of those pens are pens like 
Kavegos, Jin Hao's, Hong Dian's, Twisby's. Yeah, I, I, I really don't keep track. I had bought all four of the Hong Dian pens that I absolutely love, the 1862. Love, love those pens. I just bought the green one. The green one was the last one that I added to my collection. And then my son was home for Easter with his girlfriend and she loved the color green. So I wrapped that up and gave it to her in as one of the little presents in her Easter basket. So will I replace that? I don't know. I love the Hong Dian. I probably will, but I tend to gift a lot of my lower end pens, like a lot of my Jinhao 159s or my Jinhao 82s or my Hong Dian's. I, I just, I am more free with those, so I don't really keep track of those. And then number seven is, do you have a limit on the pens and inks in your collection? I don't. I, I wish sometimes I was more structured. One thing that I have done, um, I had to get another case, which I vowed I would never do, but somebody on the internet recommended, or someone DM'd me, and said that TJ Maxx had these like jewelry boxes that were all felt lined and uh, she had said it and I made like a mental note and then I happened to be at TJ Maxx for another reason and I walked by and it was perfect. It was like a black case with these drawers and I got the pen industry inserts that already have the little grooves for the pens that I used on my Muji acrylic case. And I put those into my new case and it is beautiful. I was looking at some of the really expensive cases that were like over $300. And I have to say, this has totally just made me so happy. I was worried about some of my more expensive pens getting too much exposure to light in the acrylic boxes because my desk upstairs is right in front of a window. This has been fantastic, but what it did was, of course, gave me more room for more pens. So I took all of my lower end pens and put them in the acrylic box. And then I have all my special pens in the black box. And I have one row with like most of my Japanese pens, or I would say my more subtle pens. And then the next row below has like all my Italian pens, my Banu's and things like that. So it actually really helped me organize because I put extra nibs and I put my dip pens and things like that in the acrylic case. And I feel much more organized with how it is right now but I don't really have a limit. Anytime I feel like I'm not using my pens enough, I feel a little overindulgent. I mean, I, I tend to not be good at tapping the brakes with collections, and this collection has been no exception, but I do use them every single day. Every day I write in the morning, every day I write at night. Um, I doodle with them. I love doing my ink swatches. It's just a way for me to unwind. So what I had started to say is in the acrylic box right now, I have an entire drawer that I'm filling with pens that I can let go of. So they're going into the drawer first. And then if they stay there for a certain amount of time, like there are like four or five that I'm certain I'm letting go of. I think probably when I go to a pen show this summer, I will probably unload some of them to give me more of a budget for the pen shows. Yeah, if I'm not using them, I will get rid of them unless they're super sentimental. So I have about six or seven that I'm ready to let go of right now. I try not to count my collection, it's dangerous. Okay, number eight, what would you do if another pen or ink came along? What do you think my answer is? <laughs> I would probably get it if I was really excited about it. I have a couple pens on the way right now. Uh, one is the Vanishing Point Whiskey, which we have been talking about all the drama surrounding that on my Juicy Broads live show. The most recent is that we wired the money to eToya. The first time it didn't get to them because we filled out the form the wrong way. We think it has reached them now. And then I have a forwarding service. I have a, an address in Japan where eToya is going to send it to because they don't ship things overseas. So they will send it to the forwarding address in Japan. That service will ship the pen to me. I have no idea when I'm gonna get this whiskey vanishing point, but I absolutely love it. I hope I love it because it's been a lot. And I purposely wanted to try it this way um, instead of like going with a reseller online only because I, I wanna get the experience of how this all works. So it's been, painful um but i and i don't know how much the forwarding service is going to cost because they'll have to weigh the item and the whiskey comes with a bottle of um, pilot iro shizuku ink which i know is going to be heavy so i don't know if it's all going to be worth it in the end but i'm hoping in the end i will get it for 
about $100 less than most of the resellers are selling it for and about $100 more than the retail when all is said and done. But I will keep you posted on that. I'm also waiting on the chai latte from Platinum, uh, which I am so excited to get. Those are starting to ship out this week. But um, I think I purchased that around like the middle of February. So that's, I've been waiting for that. Just yesterday, actually, my husband ordered me uh, Every Rose Has Its Thorn, which is, uh, I think, a North America exclusive through Sailor. It's a Sailor Pro Gear. As I said earlier, I thought I was done with Sailors, but I just love them. I only have one other Pro Gear. I have a bunch of Pro Gear Slims. I'm letting go of a couple. But the only Pro Gear that I have is the Yoseka Home Pen, and I absolutely love it. I got it in a medium nib. That medium nib is so, so juicy and I love it, but I feel like I want a medium fine. I don't think I would go fine or extra fine, but I love the medium fine nibs on the 21 karat winter rain, which is a pro gear slim. So I'm sure I'm going to love it in the larger size for the pro gear. We do have the Dutch pen show in June that I'm going to. I don't know that I'm going to DC anymore because Yoseka is having theirs and I can drive to Yoseka. I can save myself money on a flight. So I'm still up in the air on that. And then I'll have Orlando and then the Commonwealth Pen Show. So I think once the Pen Show season begins, which is right around the corner, there will probably be no more online purchases. I will be saving for Pen Shows and like Pen Show exclusives and things like that. And I think that's when I will sell some of my things. But I do have three pens three very, very special pens that I am waiting on right now. So that is it. Those are the eight questions. Um, it's really fun to talk about how this all has evolved and I'm sure my pen taste will change. I'm sure there will be new pens in my life and I will say goodbye to some other pens. What's nice about collecting pens is there's always somebody who's at a different phase than you. So things that were really exciting to me in the beginning that I may not be using anymore can be really exciting for somebody else. Something that is no longer being loved by one person can be passed on and admired and used by someone else. So thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoy content about fountain pens, planning, and journaling, be sure to subscribe to my channel and I will be back soon with a new video. If you had a good time, hit the thumbs up button. It means so much to me and I will see you soon. Thanks again to Leanne and Simone for putting this together. It was a lot of fun. Take care.